OK, good evening, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Wednesday, the 26th day of June 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 6 p.m. start. The clock on my cell phone is showing 6.06 .06 p.m. May I have a roll call for the commencement of this meeting? Councilperson Ridley? Here. Councilperson Prinzeri? Here. Councilperson Bagiano will be out for this meeting. Councilperson Soleil? Here. Councilperson Solomon? Here. Councilperson Gilmore? Present. Councilperson DeGees? She won't be here, but give Tracy a minute. She got to set up. We can't do nothing without the recorder. OK. Yeah, I'm call us again. Yeah. Just give me a second. We're just going to finish setting up. Is there anyone here for Black Music Month that's accepting the resolution. OK, can you see Erica, please? Just going to check in with her. Thank you. Congratulations to everyone that's here. Take a break. 
Okay, we're gonna begin. I promise we are this time. Can we please close the back door? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, good evening, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Wednesday, the 26th day of June, 2024. This is a regular meeting of the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 6 p.m. start and the clock on my cell phone is showing 6, 11 p.m. May I have a roll call for the commencement of this meeting? Councilperson Ridley. Here. Councilperson Prinzeri. Here. Councilperson Bacciano will be out. Councilperson Soleil. Here. Councilperson Solomon. Here. Councilperson Gilmore. Present. Councilperson DeGis. She's out. Oh, she'll, she'll be out for you. Yeah. Okay. Councilperson DeGis will be out for this meeting as well. Councilperson Rivera. Here. Council President Waterman. Here. Okay. I have seven council members present at 6, 11 p.m. Can we kindly raise for a moment of silence, please? John Hanlon Sr. Please remain standing as we salute to the flag. On behalf of Council President Waterman and the members of the Municipal Council, in accordance with the New Jersey Public Laws of 1975, Chapter 231, the Open Publics Meeting Act, also known as the Sunshine Law, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by posting on the bulletin board of the first floor of City Hall, the annual notice, which is the scheduled of meetings and caucuses of the Municipal Council for the calendar year 2024 and filed in the Office of the City Clerk on Thursday, November 30th, 2023. In addition, at the time of this preparation, the agenda of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, June 21st, 2024 at 217 p.m. to the Mayor, Municipal Council, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers and posted on the city's website so I can certify as to the total compliance with the Sunshine Law. Okay. Um, I need a motion to add items 10.65 resolution 24-538 and item 10.66 resolution 24-539. Councilman Soleil with the uh, motion. Thank you. Second. Councilman Solomon, second. Thank you very much. Okay, motion to add items 10.65 and 10.66. Motion made by Councilperson Soleil, seconded by Councilperson Solomon, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Councilperson DeGis. Oh, sorry, she's going to be out. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. The items are approved. 7-0 to add items 10.65 and 10.66 to this agenda. We're going to move on to our first reading uh, ordinances. I believe it, Amanda, I have, to, I have to amend. She's going to vote it out. Okay, um, so item number 3.1, City Ordinance 24-056 is an ordinance of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City adopting amendments to the Journal Square 
2060 redevelopment plan regarding inclusions of a mandatory affordable housing requirement along with updates to some bulk signage and use standards. Council members, we are taking a uh, no, we're going to that's read right into the record. Now, item 3.2, ordinance 24-057 is an ordinance of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City adopting amendments to the Lewis uh, Munoz Marion Boulevard redevelopment plan regarding use and bulk standards to District 2 of the redevelopment plan and other associated standards. We are making an amendment to this item. Um, Councilperson Solomon, if you can read it into the record, please. Sure, so um, for RDP section 3B, um, 1B3E1, uh, we're adding two sections um, and they read section 6, the developer shall construct an abutment to support a 15 foot wide trail bridge across Manila Avenue. And section 7, the developer shall include subjacent and lateral support at an elevation compatible with all applicable highway and street design standards for future installation of light rail trolley on block one and trail. And then if I scroll down in section E, community benefits, the word approved is being deleted and replaced with the word determined. Um, just to add the reasons therefore this is um it's not changing the substance of the recommendation it's just to clarify what's expected and a clerical change i can add um yeah just um similar to what john said but uh, the basis for the three changes is to provide clarity on the developer's obligations and the city's responsibilities regarding the build out of the embankment um, and the section clarifies the developer's obligation to construct an abutment to support a 15 foot wide trail bridge across manila the second edition clarifies the developer's obligation to build subjacent lateral support uh, at an elevation that would allow for possible light rail or trolley service on block one and the change from the word approved to determine clarifies the city's role in deciding when the bicycle pedestrian bridge shall be constructed in option C in the RDP. Okay, um, motion to amend item 3.2 ordinance 24-057 is made by person Solomon. Do I have a second? Second by council person Soleil. Motion to amend item 3.2 ordinance 24-057 made by Councilperson Solomon, seconded by Councilperson Soleil, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Okay, motion to amend item 3.2 ordinance 24-057 is um approved seven zero item three point three ordinance twenty four dash zero five eight an ordinance authorizing the acquisition by purchase or condom condemnation of a portion of private easement located between city block nine nine zero five lot nine and portion of block nine nine zero six lot one that transverses the Brunswick Community Garden. Item 3.4, Ordinance 24-059, an ordinance supplementing Chapter 332, Vehicles in Traffic, Article 9, Parking for the Disabled of the Jersey City Code, designating a reserved parking space at various locations throughout the city. Okay, Council members, we are voting on items 3.1, through 3.4, including item 3.2 as amended. Councilperson Ridley. I for introduction. Councilperson Prinzeri. I for introduction. Councilperson Soleil. Um, I wanted to say I for introduction and also want to read out something on behalf of Councilman Bogiano. Um, so the Councilman, Councilman Bogiano has worked with the Planning and Law Department on the um, the plan that you see, the 2060 redevelopment plan, and he does plan to make amendments. He has in Council Borgiano plans to make amendments to the plan to accommodate 
the different interested community groups. And as per the advice of tonight from the law department and uh, interested parties, the city council is going to be voting I for introducing the 2060 redevelopment plan that came back from the planning board. Um, Councilman Bojano will seek to have these amendments to his affordable housing plan made for the next count city council meeting on July 10th. And he looks forward to reviewing the amendments with the council in between the meetings. Uh, and that, with that, I say, vote aye for all. Thank you, Councilperson Saleh. Councilperson Solomon? Aye. Councilperson Gilmore? Aye for introduction. Councilperson Rivera? Aye. Council President Waterman? Aye for introduction. Okay. Items 3.1 through 3.4, including item 3.2 as amended, have been introduced 7 0. We are on to our second reading ordinances. Okay. Item 4.1, City Ordinance 24-047 is a bond ordinance provided for various 2024 capital acquisitions and improvements by and in the City of Jersey City in the County of Hudson, State of New Jersey, appropriating 60 million therefore and authorizing issuance of 57 million bonds or notices of the city to finance part of the cost thereof. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Second by Saleh. Motion made by Councilperson Rivera, seconded by Councilperson Saleh to close the public hearing on Ordinance 24 47. Okay, the motion to close public hearing. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. So uh, President Waterman. Aye. Okay, motion to close public hearing on this ordinance 24-047 carries 7-0 for final adoption for final consideration and adoption of city ordinance 24-047 council person Ridley aye council person Prinzeri council person Saleh I vote aye council person Solomon aye council person Gilmore aye Council Person Rivera. Okay. Council President Waterman. Okay, City Ordinance 24047 is adopted 7 0. Okay, item 4.2, City Ordinance 24 049, Ordinance Amending Chapter 188, Housing Accommodations and Affordable Housing Compliance. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Second by Soleil. Motion made by Councilperson Rivera. Second by Councilperson Soleil. Motion to close the public hearing on ordinance 24-049. Councilperson Ridley? Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri? Aye. Councilperson Soleil? Aye. Councilperson Solomon? Aye. Councilperson Gilmore? Aye. Councilperson Rivera? Aye. Council President Waterman? Aye. Okay. To close the public hearing on 20, Ordinance 24-049 is 7-0. For final consideration and adoption of Ordinance 24-049, Councilperson Ridley? Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri? Aye. Councilperson Saleh? Aye. Councilperson Solomon? Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. President Waterman. Aye. Okay. City Ordinance 24-049 is adopted 7-0.
Item 4.3, an ordinance supplement, uh, I'm sorry, item 4.3, city ordinance 24-050, an ordinance supplementing chapter 332, vehicles and traffic, article two, traffic regulations, section 332-A, prohibited right turns on red signal to prohibit turns on right at all times along Montgomery Street. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion by Soleil. Second by Waterman. Okay, motion made by Council Person Soleil, seconded by Council President Waterman. Okay, on the motion to close public hearing on Ordinance 24-050, Council Person Ridley. Aye. Council Person Prinzeri. Aye. Council Person Soleil. Aye. Council Person Solomon. Aye. Council Person Gilmore. I'm going to um abstain on this, but um I do uh hope that traffic will put these new signs up this is i'm sorry council person this is just for the public hearing portion oh excuse me i okay. <laughs> council person rivera um i also president waterman i okay motion to close the public hearing on ordinance 24-050 70 For final consideration and adoption of city ordinance 24-50, council person Ridley. Aye. Council person Prinzeri. Aye. Council person Baggiano. He's okay. not here. <laughs> council person Soleil. Aye. Council person Solomon. Aye. Council person Gilmore. And I'm going to abstain. Um, and I just hope traffic uh, can get something out um, and ahead of time, just to advise people, there's no longer you're going to be able to turn on the entire um, Montgomery. So it's, it's a plethora of blocks from Bergen all the way down here. Um, I just hope that they put out sufficient amount of notice so people can know. Council person, did Jesus not here as well? Council person Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. So with this ordinance, city ordinance 24-050, we have um, 601 with Council uh, Person Baggiano and Dejis out and Council Person Gilmore abstaining. And the, the city ordinance 24-050 is still adopted. Six votes. Okay, uh, item 4.4, .4, city ordinance 24-051, an ordinance supplementing chapter 332, vehicles and traffic, article two, traffic regulations, amending section 332-9, stop intersections, to designate the intersections along Griffith Street as a multi-way stop controlled intersections. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Second by Soleil. To close the public hearing on ordinance 24-051, motion made by Councilperson Waterman, second by Councilperson Soleil. On the motion to close a public hearing on city ordinance 24-051, council person Ridley, council person Prinzeri. Aye. Council person Baggiano. Not he's here. He's not, he's gonna be out for the whole meeting. <laughs> yeah, Thank you know, so I much, I will remember. <laughs> council person Aye. Council person Solomon. Aye. Council person Gilmore. Aye. Council person DeGis is out. Council person Rivera. Aye. Council president Waterman. Aye. Okay, so 7-0, motion carries to close public hearing on city ordinance 24-051. Okay, for final consideration and adoption of city ordinance 24-051, council person Ridley. Aye. Council person Prince Aaron. Aye. Council person out, council person Soleil. I want to thank the Department of Infrastructure and um, Director Barker Patel and uh, Director Jen Wong uh, from Traffic and Engineering for bringing this. Um, we've had people, several people that have almost died at that intersection. So 
these stop signs will be a welcome safety addition to that the, that street, those streets. Um, and with that, I vote aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeJesus out. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. City Ordinance 24-051 is adopted. 7-0. Item 4.5, City Ordinance 24-052, an ordinance supplementing Chapter 332, Vehicles and Traffic, Article 2, Traffic Regulations, amending Section 332-9, Stop Intersections, to designate the intersections of Monticello Avenue with Fairmont Avenue and Storms Avenue as a multi-way stop controlled section. Controlled intersection, sorry. Um, this is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion to close public hearing by Councilperson Soleil. May I have a second? Second. Ooh. Second made by Councilperson Rivera. On the motion to close public hearing on ordinance 24-052, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Council Pre uh, Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is out. Person Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGisi. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. Motion carries 7 0 to close the public hearing on Ordinance 24 052 for final consideration and adoption of Ordinance 24 052. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Brunzeri. Just want to thank our traffic. Infrastructure Division and Department for You're continuing to work on the oh, toolbox for traffic calming with this intersection and also to Councilman Gilmore for partnering for additional community meetings to make sure everybody's voice was heard. Aye. Thank you. Councilperson Bagiano is out. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Oh, I um I just want to say thank you to um traffic and engineer. I know the community uh we were like to have seen um a light at the intersection, um, but given the results of the study and I guess the financial capacity, uh the compromise was to stop always at all in all directions. Um so in light of all that I have well, I. Thank you. Councilperson DeGis is out. Councilperson Rivera? Aye. Council President Waterman? Aye. Okay. City Ordinance 24-052 is adopted 7-0. Item 4.6, City Ordinance 24-053, an ordinance of the Municipal Council adopting amendments to the Greenville Industrial Redevelopment Plan to create the Linden Avenue East Remediation and Improvement Bonus. This is a Public hearing on Ordinance 24-053. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Second by Soleil. Sorry. Motion made by Councilperson Rivera. Second by Councilperson Soleil. To close the public hearing on 24-053. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bacciano is out. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore? Aye. Councilperson DeGis is out. Councilperson Rivera? Council President Waterman? Aye. Okay, motion to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-053 is 7-0. For final consideration and adoption of City Ordinance 24-053, Councilperson Rick? Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri? Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is out. Councilperson Soleil? Aye. Councilperson Salvador. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis is out. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay, for final consideration and adoption of this ordinance, seven that is seven zero. It, the ordinance is adopted. Um, item 4.7, City Ordinance 24-054. An ordinance authorizing the sale of certain easement and 
property ownership rights in city property located at block 287, lot 5, and block 149, lot 9 on the tax maps of the town of Kearney to the New Jersey Department of Transportation for 1098000 subject to the city's rights to continued use and maintenance of its water line. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Okay, motion made by Council President Waterman. Second, Vice Councilperson Soleil. Second by Councilperson Soleil. On the motion to close public um, hearing on Ordinance 24-054, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is out. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. To close the public hearing. Councilperson Gilmore. Gilmore, she's talking to you. All right. Yes. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Okay, motion to close public hearing on city ordinance 24-05470. For final consideration and adoption of ordinance 24-054, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGees is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. City Ordinance Number 24-054 is adopted 7-0. Okay, item. Item 4.8, City Ordinance 24-055, an ordinance amending Chapter 218, Multiple Dwelling, Section 1, Uniform Security Service, and Section 1.1, Security Service for Seniors, Housing, Housing for the Disabled, Mandatory of the Jersey City Municipal Code. This is a public hearing on this ordinance. Any member of the public wishing to... Motion. Second. Okay, Vice Soleil. Motion to close the public hearing on City Ordinance 24-055, made by Councilperson Waterman, second by Councilperson Soleil. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. Motion to close public hearing on City Ordinance 24-055 is 7-0. For final consideration and adoption of Ordinance 24-055, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay, City Ordinance Number 24-055 is adopted 7-0. Okay, we're done with the second reading ordinances. Going to move on to the public hearing of the 2024-2025 Historic Downtown SID Assessment Roll and Budget. Is there any member of the public wishing to be heard? Motion. Second. Motion made by Councilperson Soleil, seconded by Councilperson Rivera. Okay, to close the public hearing on the SID for uh, Historic Downtown, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prince Aries. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGeese is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Council Aye. President, thank you. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay, to close the public hearing on the SID for Historic Downtown is 7-0. Now I'm going to defer to items 10.2 resolution 24-485 through 10 uh, items 10.2 resolutions 24-495 and items 
Item 10.66, Resolution 24-539. These are all of the um, recipients for the Black Music Month. We're going to... Yeah, Erica, she's... Erica's going to read... We got we to gotta vote. We got to vote first. We got to vote to defer. Oh, oh. Yeah, defer. Let's wait a minute, Erica. We got to vote to defer. Okay, so motion to defer made by Councilperson Gilmore. Yes. May I have a second? Second. By Councilperson Saleh. Yep. A okay, motion to defer to these items. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bagiano is not here. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson Tajis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. Okay. So the resolutions are approved 7 0. Well, deferred. We, we defer them, Amanda. Now we got to vote on them. Okay. Don't worry. You'll get through it. Okay, so I am going to take a vote now on these resolutions. Then we can hand them out to the recipients. Okay. So we have items 10.12, resolution 24-485 through items 10.22, resolution 24-495 and item 10.66, resolution 24-539. Councilperson Ridley. Uh, I'd like to congratulate all the recipients of the awards for Black Music Month. Um, this is a great time to acknowledge all of your uh, success in the music industry, um, not only just here being representatives of Jersey City, but in general, your contribution to music and to Black music. So we appreciate you, we honor you, and congratulations. With that, I vote aye. Thank you, Councilperson Ridley. Councilperson. Councilperson Prinzeri. I just want to say congratulations and thank you all for sharing your talent with Jersey City and um, the rest of the nation, quite honestly. Um, it is an honor to um, acknowledge your excellence in your respective crafts. So congratulations. I vote aye. Councilperson Saleh. I just want to congratulate all the recipients and honorees. Um, your contributions to music um, are not to be understated. And, you know, you guys don't get your flowers. And today we have to give you your flowers and they're due. And so much of our culture in America, you know, takes and takes and takes from black culture. And we never actually acknowledge the root of like who the movers and shakers really are. And today we're honoring them. With that, I vote aye. Council person Solomon. And I want to thank my colleagues for bringing the resolution forward and thank all of you for the incredible music uh, you performed. And uh, so glad uh, for Black Music Month. We're here to celebrate uh, all the work you do for Jersey City. So I very proudly vote aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Um, well, it's such an honor for me to highlight all you individuals who made a huge contribution. Um, DB, I went to school with. Um, it's been very inspirational, excuse me, inspirational since we were younger. Um, DJ P Dub, you already know all the mixtapes and everything. It's just great. DJ Wiz. Gerald Austin, Devil X Posse, uh, Cool Ray. Uh, fun fact, I always wanted to be a rapper listening to Cool Ray. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I didn't make it because I'm here now. Um, but thank you for your contribution. Uh, Paul Kaiser, Susie Q, one of my best friends, just an extraordinary person, extraordinary talent. 
Uh, Mr. Bass as well. Sharia J. Um, I don't know if I can say this. Uh, my grammar school crush. I don't know if my wife's going to be mad, but that was my grammar school crush. Um, my brother Sam Black, whom also I went to school with. Uh, Mr. Low Cash, man, where's Low at? I see Low in here. Thank you so much, man. Low's been like a mentor to me as well. So thank you, uh, DJ Wimpy too. So thank all of y'all for y'all contributions, man. We really appreciate them. I vote aye. Councilperson Rivera. Um, from from one musician to another, you guys are amazing, inspirational. Music is 100% medicine, and you guys make it happen. You guys soothe when people need it the most. I proudly vote I. Council President Waterman. I want to say congratulations to all the honorees. Um, Black Music Month was created because it was forgotten about. They have forgotten about black music. And so it was so important that people spearheaded to remind people when you really um, understand music and the, uh, the origin of it, black music inspired so many, inspired so many. And so today we are celebrating all of your talent, um, all that you have been through, um, because music is inspirational, it's healing, and not only that, music is a language. And so with that, I proudly vote aye. Thing went off. Um, so if we can, normally we allow um, people two to three minutes, but in light of it being so many people, we will we'll invite everyone up. If you guys can be brief as possible as it relates to your thank yous to whoever supported you during your endeavor in your career. Um, so I guess if everyone could come up. Hey, and, Erica, and, Erica, you want to call them at one oh, at a time? I just so need Erica. to recap the vote. I just need to finish the vote and then we can do that for sure. Um, so uh, just give me a second. So items 10.12 resolution 24-485 through items 10.22 resolution 24-495 as well as item 10.66 resolution resolution 24-539 are approved 70. So we have 10.12 Resolution 10.12, 24-485, a resolution recognizing Justin DiBiase Hall for his exceptional contributions to the music industry and cultural landscape of Jersey City in honor of Black Music Month. Justin. Good. I get to talk. I want to appreciate y'all for this. This is well deserved. I feel like oh, I got oh, this is an extra one. Yeah, I think I could have gave that to my mother. Hey, yo, I want to thank y'all for inviting me for this. This is well deserved. Very thankful for it. I be feeling like the city don't be caring about us a lot. So being that I got this, is it really hit home. I feel good about that. One more thing I gotta say is DB weekend around the corner. Y'all have a blessed day. Yeah. Resolution 10.13, 24-486, a resolution recognizing Michael DJ P. Dub Tucker for his outstanding contributions to the music and cultural heritage of Jersey City in honor of Black Music Month. DJ P. Dub. I just want to thank everybody. What's, DB, you forgot your thing, DB. Oh, uh, it's the same thing. I want to thank the councilman, Jersey City, everybody that has something to do with my career. Thank you.
And if all the artists could stick around so we could take a group picture out of the way at the end or in the, in the hallway. Resolution 10.14, a resolution recognizing Donald DJ Wiz Davis for his outstanding contributions to the music and cultural heritage of Jersey City in honor of Black Music Month. Donald DJ Wiz. First of all, I'd like to thank the council and everyone involved with uh, this really giving me this award and doing this for over 45 years of my life. Long time. And to get this now really means a lot. Most of all, I want to thank my family, my girl, Shalom Wilson. She does a lot, a whole lot. Love you, babe. And uh, all the recipients out there, you know, Black music will live on when we're all gone. I just want you all to know that. God bless. Take care. Resolution 10.15, the resolution recognizing Gerald Austin for his extraordinary contributions to the music industry, his unwavering commitment to community service, and his exemplary role as an artist and humanitarian, recognizing him as a cherished and influential figure in Jersey City and beyond. So um, Gerald couldn't be here today, and we have a, a family and friend accepting his award. Oh. Esther Whitney. Obviously, I am not uh, Gerald Austin. I was about to say, Pastor, the law is you. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, if I were ever to receive a resolution, it would be for the worst singer. But uh, as his pastor and on his behalf, uh, we do say thank you. He would have loved to be here tonight, but he's at another celebration, his wedding anniversary. So we applaud him for that as well. Ten point sixteen, a resolution recognizing Double X Posse for their outstanding contributions to hip hop and for representing the spirit. Double X Posse for their outstanding contributions to hip hop and for representing the spirit and resilience of Jersey City on the global stage, recognizing their achievements and lasting impact on the music industry and the community. Double X Posse. Well, I'm not, I just wanna say thank you to the city council first. Uh, I wanna say a special shout out to Educational Gilmore. I like that. He always used to sing my record to me. My man, it's a little special for me to do. I had a brother, my brother, a member of the. My brother, a member of Double X Posse. Started it with me from day one, Brian Coltman. And he just passed mm. from cancer recently. So this is a award that I know he would really appreciate. We put in a lot of hard work for this, as well as being a part of the first rap group to bring hip hop to Jersey City. That's the Sweet Slick and Sly crew. They are the originators, the group who brought rap to Jersey City. So all of us today come from that. I also wanna give a shout out to my daughter. She in the building. Mm -hmm. She's getting an award too. So that makes it super official for me. Uh, I don't wanna hold up too much time. I could go on and on for days, but I appreciate the award. And we love hip hop. And it's what we'll do until the day we die. I wonder my man, my money, say a little. Can you thing. can you state your name for the record, please? Excuse me. Your name for the record. My name is Ray Rothschild, Sugar Ray of the Double X Pass.
Yeah. And I just want to make one more thing. Not being the only rap group in the history of Jersey City mm -hmm. have a number one record on the Billboard charts. Yeah. You rap Jersey. Oh. All right. Mm. That's not easy to do to be number one, y'all. Not on the rap Billboard. It's not easy to do. Everybody can make a hit. Can you be number one? So I'm going to take it like this. <laughs> I'm uh, My Money. That's my name as far as hip hop. But my real name is Marshall Heath Jr. Um, me and Ray been together from day one. We got 35 years in this business. And we still doing it. And uh, I just want to give thanks to my family and friends. You know? And uh, also, I'm getting a little emotional because... My boy BK, like Ray said, it's not here anymore. So not for him to be here, but his family is. And uh, not to do shows again with this guy after 35 years is tough. But uh, we're going to hold it down. We're going to hold it down for Jersey City, the state of New Jersey. And uh, thank you, City Hall, for having us. Appreciate it. Hello, my name is Carissa. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the Coleman family, BK. Um, Brian passed away on April 29th of this year. He battled 15 years of cancer. He was a stage, two times stage four cancer survivor. Mm. He would have, I wish he was here but he's here with us and he would have been so appreciative to receive this today. So we love you, Brian. God bless you. And for his extraordinary contributions, we have resolution 10.17, 24490. For his extraordinary contributions to the cultural and social fabric of Jersey City, recognizing his pioneering leadership, steadfast commitment to the community and outstanding achievements and legacy in Jersey City and beyond, my uncle, Mr. Paul Kaiser. I don't know what to say. I guess I'm the oldest one here. Going back uh, over 50 years, I remember when I was at Rutgers University on campus, a good friend, I think all of you know, all of, them, all of you know of him, uh, Cliff Perkins came down and I wrote and produced this song called That's the Way It's Gotta Be, Body and Soul, when I wrote that hit. Then, then working with uh, Jimmy Briscoe and the Beavers, the Weather Girls, the Three Degrees, um, so many acts. And I want to thank, uh, I'm not from the rap world, but I want to thank Rick Ross for sampling my songs, Ghostface for sampling my songs, Childish Gambino for sampling my songs. So many people sampled all my hits that I did, and I'm really thankful. I want to thank my family that's here. I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Diane, who's here, and my uh, children, um, Eleanor, Wanda, Jasmine, uh, <laughs> Lawrence, Sonia, Ashley. Did I forget somebody, Diane? <laughs> All right, okay. I, oh, and my granddaughter, Monique, she's here too. And my, and my brother-in-law, Willie, Teresa, and all the family. Anybody in my family I miss? Oh, my, my niece, Erica. And so I'm really, I'm really thankful. The music's been good to me, and I'm still doing it. Uh, in my career, I had over 30 hit records. And so uh, God's been good to me. And I want to thank the city of... Uh, uh, Jersey City for doing this and right behind you the Gregory Park Towers for 10 years that's where I had my office at and you know doing all the songs and hits so 
thank you. I hope I didn't forget anyone. If it, if I did, it wasn't on purpose. Okay. God thank bless you. you. Next, we have resolution 10.18, 24-491. For her outstanding contributions to music, entrepreneurship, community, and recognizing her as a powerful force and invaluable asset to the cultural landscape of Jersey City, Ms. Susie Q. Hi. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you guys. Thank the council for having me here. I'm not the best public speaker, but I'm going to try my best. Um, whew, I, I've been able to lend my voice to um, the landscape of Jersey City since the tender age of uh, 16, officially. Um, I've traveled the world, um, met a lot of people. I've, again, graced a lot of stages. But if it were not for God, my family and my tribe, and my mom, my dad could not be here today. <laughs> um, and your support, your support. Um, I would not be who I am and, you know, who I can become, you know, for, uh, futuristically. So um, again, thank you. And to the council team, thanks for having me. God bless you, Sylvie. Next, we have resolution 10.19, resolution 24-492 for his outstanding contributions to music education, his unwavering dedication to his students, and his remarkable achievements in the field of vocal performance in honor of Black Music Month, Mr. Kendall J. Bass. Um, first off, thank you to the council. Thank you, Councilman Moore. I really appreciate it. Um, I love to say that I am a resident of Jersey City, born here, raised here, mm -hmm. and it's a blessing to be able to give everything that I learned in this city and give back to where I came from. Mm -hmm. And I usually don't talk much. I usually do all of my talking to the students. But one thing I can truly say is, if it wasn't for the tutelage of my family, right? thank God for my family, love you guys. Um, and especially my mother, who I know is watching over me. If it wasn't for the tutelage of that and the learning of all of the musicians and the amazing people around me, I would not be able to be the educator I am. So, I tell everyone here, even old, young, if there's anything, your voice is powerful. Use your voice and we have to give into these children. And I'm blessed and honored to be able to just serve the children and make them a better version of what we all are today. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have resolution 1020, 24493. For her outstanding contributions to music, dance, fashion, and the arts, recognizing her achievements, dedication, and positive impact that she's had on the community of Jersey City and beyond, Ms. Sharaya J.
Oh my gosh, thank you so much for this. I'm 100% on it. I appreciate this so much. My supporters and all my friends and family, um, they know how I love my city. And as far as I go around this world, I will always wrap my hood. Y'all already know. But um, I'm very appreciative. And also, thank you very much for my brand new baby boy. You know, he's a new part of my life. So he inspires me and my music and my art. And so I'm just very, very grateful for him. And to the creator, I mean, y'all already know. God, 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 God. I can't say it enough. God, 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 God. Thank you so much. Thank you, King. I appreciate you. Jersey City, stand up! <laughs> there we go. We got three more, y'all. <laughs> it's a good day. This next one is resolution 10.21, resolution 24-494 for his outstanding contributions to the musical and cultural heritage of Jersey City and his unwavering dedication to his craft and community. We honor Mr. Sam Black. Uh, first of all, thank the city, thank the council for um, giving us the opportunity. Uh, coming from where I'm from, man, you don't make the city all, so I'm just happy to be here. Um, I do it for the land, I do it for us, I do it for Jersey City, so it's one for Jersey City. Resolution 10.22, 24-495, for his significant contributions to the music and entertainment industries, recognizing his dedication, creativity, and the positive impact he has had on the community of Jersey City and beyond, Mr. Low Cash. I don't know who it is. Uh, I just want to thank God my, for my mother and my father that made this right here me. And they was able to give me something that money can't buy. You know what I'm saying? You can't buy this type of cool, this type of swag, or or the belief and the knowing to know that I know what I know. I thank you too. Education is your money. Yeah. Before I read this last one, I just want to invite everybody to come join us at the Music Networking Mixer immediately following this meeting at the factory. We'll be there till midnight with uh, music by DJ Wiz, who just got honored today. Resolution, last but certainly not least, resolution 10.66, resolution 24-539. For his outstanding contributions to the music industry and his unwavering commitment to excellence, recognizing him as a true legend and an invaluable asset to the Jersey City community, we honor DJ Wimpy B. I'd like to thank the council. I mean, I really don't talk really well without the music behind me, but uh. I'd like to thank y'all for acknowledging me for something that I'm very passionate about for so many years. I mean, me and Wiz go back so far, like 79, 1980, playing music. If anybody knew that we was out here putting our footprints real deep in the cement out here in these streets, playing music for every event possible, I just want to thank y'all for acknowledging me, man, because to me, music is passion, music is infinite, and I live by that, man. And I'm very passionate about my craft. And I'd like to thank the council for acknowledging me, and I really appreciate this. I really do. Thank you so much.
Congratulations to everyone again. If you want a big round of applause. If you are um, planning to leave, you can um, move at this moment before we continue the meeting. Did you guys want to do a picture in here or in the rotunda? Okay. If, if all the artists had come to the front, we're going to do a group shot right here. Can you bring them back from the rotunda? All the musicians, just the artists, just the honorees. Yeah. If all the honorees could come back to the front. If you're leaving out, <laughs> don't be a You know, she was one of my favorite teachers. Where is she? She got Yeah. Oh, she's yeah, that's my other teacher. But she's, uh, right. I don't want to be talking so about the oldest one that taught at Ferris. Hey, she did. Hey, 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 hey. all. She could all. Yeah, I definitely, I, yeah. I, she, she's right. a, a little. Testing. Okay. Yes. All honorees, could they come to the front? All honorees, could you come to the front? Honorees to the front. Thank you. Come on. They're shot right for it. <laughs> BJs will come to good spots. Gotta feed them children. <laughs> All right, Mike, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're done now. Scott, I'm running right behind you right here. Huh? Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. I will. I'm Because it's Black Music Month, I'ma say I ain't got to go home, but <laughs> no, but we do need to adjourn back to business so everybody can go into the rotunda.
Okay, okay guys. Guys, we have to start. Excuse me. Yes. Okay, guys. Okay. Erica. Erica. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Go celebrate. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Decorum, decorum, everyone. Wait a minute, they, they, they going out. They know decorum. They know decorum. No, my mic is not loud, I know. Yeah. They know decorum. Everybody's just excited, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, that's what I said. We couldn't. Till one come back. Yeah, we got we got one more. Thank you, Erica. As soon as she closed the door. All righty, here we go. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. We're going to move on to the public speaking portion of our meeting. Our first public speaker for tonight, Tina Nalls. She's not here. Tina is not here. Okay, on to 5.2, Stefan. No. Okay, 5.3, Maureen. Maureen. Maureen Crowley. I'm sorry? Did you call my name, Stephen Gucciardo? I yep. did, I I'm did. So sorry, can I still speak? Council President. Go ahead, because we I know you probably didn't hear it, the noise, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the time to speak. Uh, the Embankment Preservation Coalition supports the passage of these amendments to the Louis Minot's Marin Redevelopment Plan as a means to reaching settlement concerning blocks one through eight of the Harsmas Branch rail line. As the zoning amount amendments outline, the development of block one of the embankment from Marin Boulevard to Manila Avenue can only take place when the conveyance of the remaining embankment blocks two through six and portions of block seven and, or, and eight are conveyed to the city. The amendments outline public benefits on block one, which include a 30 foot public right of way, the entire length of the block, a grand staircase and public elevator providing direct access to the right of way for pedestrians two restrooms and support stanchions for future bridges across Marin and Manila. The amendments also outline strict historic preservation guidelines designed to preserve the Western Embankment Wall on block one and two. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Embankment Wall on block one and two adjacent walls running east. Together with the Sixth Street Embankment Redevelopment Plan already passed by council, these plans will mitigate adverse effects to historic resources, preserving intact most of the embankment for the historically compatible purposes of open space, trail, and possible future light rail. These amendments to block one represent what we hope is a successful compromise that will avoid years more of litigation. What we need now is for the LLCs to agree to reasonable terms that guarantee the conveyance of the remaining embankment parcels to the city. The goal is to be back in front of this council by the end of summer for your approval of a settlement agreement that would make this redevelopment plan and our vision for the Sixth Street embankment a reality. The coalition appreciates having a seat at the table and we will continue to work with the parties so that these zoning guidelines result in the creation 
of a project we can all be proud of. Uh, we thank Councilman Solomon, the planning department, the legal department, and the Albanese organization for their work in bringing this solution forward. Thank you for the time. Thank you. That clock set right. Okay, Maureen. Um, hello, and I'm, I'm also talking about the am amendments to the Marin plan. On behalf of the Embankment Coalition, I would like to thank this council for your support and also recognize the long-term support of our city's mayors and councils and administrative departments, especially law, planning and infrastructure for what started as a grassroots preservation and conservation initiative. We would especially like to thank Councilman Solomon for his coordination of efforts to settle longstanding legal matters. When the Embankment Coalition organized 26 years ago, historic preservation and open space were not the very top priorities for a city attempting to deal with the wreckage left by departing railroads. The intervening decades have only provided overwhelming evidence that the Harsimus branch embankment must be preserved. The site now hosts a natural forest that oxygenates and cools the air, as we've certainly noticed in the present heat wave. It sequesters carbon and stormwater in a floodplain. It provides the promise of an off-road long distance route enabling walkers and bicyclists to get through the city safely. And now with the option in this plan that will be pursued by the redeveloper, the city will also add a sizable amount of affordable housing to these public benefits. Enacting this plan is an important step towards securing the site, and we thank you for being responsive to the public need to do so. And I must say that I'm looking forward, if we get the settlement, to having this sort of celebratory night that we've just enjoyed here. Thank you. That's the truth, Maureen. It's been a long journey. Michael? Good evening. I'm Mike Ehrman, the chairman of the Affordable Housing Task Force of Journal Square Community Association. Tonight is a big night for us. Thank you, Council, for the first reading th this evening. Thank in absentia Rich Bojano for all the work he has done. I want to comment on two items. Uh, Councilman Sali talked about discussions that you're going to be having in the next two weeks regarding minor changes in what you've uh, done a first reading on, specifically to eliminate at least temporarily two districts from coverage. Uh, this is a minor move in terms of paperwork. It's four lines and 13 pages. It's a minor move in terms of the importance of what you've done tonight, and it actually brings uh, coverage back to conformance with uh, what the council resolution had back in um, April. We support this because covering districts one, three, five, seven, and eight is the right way to go these days in Journal Square. These are the five most heavily developing areas. And remember the goal of this is to have development include affordable housing. You go first to where it's happening. Uh, the, the other two districts that are proposed for looking at later do not have the same level of development. The second item I want to talk about, I want to be clear, this is not Councilman Bojano speaking. This is Journal Square speaking. Uh, we are a community group rather than a member of government. We are asking tonight and will continue to ask publicly for the next two weeks that the creativity of this city government is utilized 
to have a final vote on this amendment on the uh, 10th of July. Uh, here's our problem. For the last two years, as, the, as this has happened, many properties have been approved by the development planning process without any affordable housing. If you do not vote on July 10th for the final version, uh, you probably delay till September. You have another two months in which other properties will be submitted to the development process that will be grandfathered. So we plead with the ingenuity that you can find of state gov of city government to find, stay legal, but to find some way of having a final vote on July 10th. Thank you very much again for all of your support. Nick Rivera. Good evening, Jersey City Council members. My name is Nick Rivera. I live in Jersey City with my wife Madeline and my two kids, Nathaniel and Madison. I was raised here myself, so I've been in the city my entire life and I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen the luxury high rises going up and the rents going up with them. Lately, things have gotten especially hard for working families like mine. When I found out the luxury landlords like Equity Residential have been using algorithms to set their rents, it made sense. Rents have gone through the roof. Even if the software isn't being used to set all the rents in Jersey City, it may be affecting rents across the board. My rent also has almost doubled since I moved here. No one should have to choose between paying their rent and supporting their children and their families. The landlords that squeeze renters and potentially violate antitrust laws and this process are the same landlords that squeeze Jersey City workers like me. My wife and I both used to work as concierges at an equity residential building at 131 Dudley. I worked hard to provide the residents of that building with the luxury experience that they are paying so much rent for. Yet I was excluded from sharing in that prosperity that I contributed to. When I tried to organize my coworkers to ask for decent standards at work and job stability, Madeline and I were both fired. All I did was deliver a petition to equity, which was supported by 32 BJ. I hope we all get our jobs back, but that doesn't change how hard the past 11 months have been. We have yet to still find new jobs. We're still struggling and we are very behind on our bills. I don't wanna leave Jersey City. That would be almost heartbreaking after just turning 42 and being here my entire life. I don't expect to be anywhere else, but sometimes the thought does cross my mind. It's been harder to have a decent life here as a residential worker. It is our hard work that has made all this luxury development possible and we are struggling to make ends meet, even when we work multiple jobs. Luxury landlords have shown no respect for the working people of Jersey City, who keep this city running and keep this city going. They're making billions of dollars every year as they keep putting up rents, taking your advantage time is up. not just your of time the workers, is up. but also of the residents. Your, your time is up. Okay. Okay. I'm um, just about done. No, 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 no. If you're done. You can't. You can't. Okay. No Three problem. minutes is it. Thank you, everyone. Thank I really you. appreciate you having me here. Thank you. Maribel? Maribel? Bet. Hello, 
I'll be reading a translated testimony in English once Marambo delivers her testimony in Spanish. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Buenas noches, miembro de Consejo Municipal de Jesse City. Y mi nombre es Maribel Brisita. Vivo en el 88 Van Rip Street en la ciudad de Jesse City con mis esposos y mis tres hijos. He vivido aquí por 10 años. Mi esposo y yo trabajamos a tiempo completo, pero apenas no estamos logrando mantener. Es imposible seguir los aumentos de alquiler que hemos enfrentado en esta ciudad en los últimos años. Mi alquiler ha aumentado 60 anualmente. Parece que todo está subiendo acepto nuestro salario y la tecnología, fijación de alquileres están es empeorando todo. Trabajo como portero en la Hacienda de Warren, un edificio de alquiler de lujo en la ciudad de Jesse City, propiedad de Ecuri, residencial. Algunos de los apartamentos de ese edificio cuentan 5 mil dólares al mes para alquilar. He trabajado allí durante más de un año y todavía me pagan el salario mínimo. No tengo beneficios significativos. Esto se siente como un insulto. Sé que la compañía Ecuri solo puede cobrar alquileres tan altos debido a lo duro que mis compañeros de trabajo y yo trabajamos para mantener el edificio limpio y seguro. Después de pagar el alquiler, mi familia se quedan con 200 para comprar comida y otros elementos esenciales. Vivimos de cheque en cheque. Me gustaría conseguir otro trabajo para mantener a mi familia, pero tengo que cuidar a mis hijos y no puedo pagar a la ciudad el cuidado de los niños. Eh, yo paso cinco horas en la semana viajando al trabajo y 60 dólares semanal de costo de trabajo. Todo lo que quiero es poder permitirme tener una vida decente para mi familia en la ciudad en la que trabajo. Gracias por tomar el tiempo para entender cómo es mi vida. Espero que nos apoyes y apoye nuestra lucha por una vida mejor para todos. Residente de la ciudad de Jesse City. Gracias. Good evening. Good evening, Jersey City Council members. My name is Maribel Barista. I live in 88 Van, Ripi Van Ripin Street, neighborhood of Jersey City with my husband and three kids. I've lived there for over 10 years. My husband and I both work full time, but we barely getting by. It's impossible to keep up with the rent increase we have been faced with in this city. Yearly rent has gone up by $60. It seems like everything is going up except for our wages and rent setting technology is making everything so much worse. I work as a porter at 100 Warren, a luxury rental building in Jersey City owned by Equity Residential. Some of the apartments in the building cost $5,000 a month. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't need everybody to talk. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have worked for, there for two years and I still get paid minimum wage. I have no meaningful benefits. This feels like an insult. I know equity is only able to charge such high, such high rents because of how hard my coworkers and I work to keep building clean, to keep building the clean and secure. After paying my rent, my family is left with only $200 to buy food and other essentials with. We live paycheck to paycheck. I will get another job to support my family, but I have to take care of my kids and I can afford child health child care. I already spend five hours a week traveling to and from work and $60 on travel. All I want is to be able to afford and have a decent life for my family in the city I work in. Thank you for taking the time to understand what my life is like. I hope you will stand with us and support our fight for a better life for all Jersey City residents. Thank you. Thank you. Albert, Albert, 5.7, Albert. He's not here. No. Hey, uh, Laverne. She left. Oh, yeah, she. Oh, no, Laverne is right there. You know what? God bless you all. I'm a person 
who fights for affordable housing. And it's a disgrace that we're going through what this pair of babies has said about working hard, paying their rent. And I keep trying to explain to people the different levels of affordable housing, workforce housing, it's a big difference. And they go by different scale. I used to go to Trenton, then to Washington. I used to be on the Affordable Housing Commission. And we fought for things like this. We got to do better, work better. I did two affordable housing. And I didn't make money out of it. But at night, I told the developers that they thought they robbed me. I sleep good at night knowing that I know in each one of them buildings, the Webb building now belongs to Housing Authority, the Fred Martin building, that 80 people got somewhere to live that's affordable in this city. It's getting rough around here. That's why I do what I do. People think I work in this building. I got 10 phone numbers in my phone right now that people work me to help them to get apartments, to get vouchers. We got to do better. It's rough. It's rough. That's why I come here. And this is what I do when I work with young people. I'm getting ready to start my camp in two weeks. This year, I got so many people sending their kids because they can't even afford a $25 reservation fee at some of these camps. Everything I do is free. I don't get grab money for what I do. People like this man here, Garini Plumbing. Now, the Chevrolet page on Garfield Avenue, Ask Chevrolet. He's putting five of my children on their pay bay 40 hours at $15 an hour. Garini Plumbing's putting seven. I don't get no money. I raise my money with developers and, 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 and lawyers for developers and out here in these streets. I don't get a dime for over 30 years what I do. I get back brand new clothes from Macy's, school supplies, summer camp, after school program. This thing ain't about me. It's about doing God's work, helping out people in this city. Ain't nothing personal with me. I don't come down here. That should be coming down here. God said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give shelter to the poor. This is my work. This is my work. It ain't about no Laverne Webb, Washington. It's about the people of this city. Gina? Gina Davison, Ward F. Good evening. As always, I want to thank the council for their time and attention. I'm here tonight to show support for item 10.23, resolution 24-496, topic of housing and cost of living. This is the resolution calling for a ban of the use of algorithmic systems to set price and supply of rental units a ban on essentially creating a virtual monopoly in this city for our uh, landowners. What this technology does is that it optimizes profits for landlords. These algorithms and technology like it can be manipulative and are being shown to push costs upward for residents. Coming from tech, I will continue to remind you all that technology is not a panacea. It replicates and sometimes magnifies inequalities that exist because of human issues. Issues of racism and inequality are propagated and promoted through algorithmic use and AI. Until we find ways to fix this, we need ex to use extreme caution. And this call for legislation of acceptable use of these, these types of algorithms is a perfect example of what we should be doing. So I want to thank Councilperson James Solomon and his office for this resolution and urge you all to vote yes on item 10.23. Thank you.
I'm also here tonight as a uh, to remind us that it has been 10 months since Jersey City Police Department murdered Andrew Washington in his home during a mental health crisis. The last word from Director Shea and from the city remains, we wish it had ended differently. It's been 10 months, show us. It seems to me we continue to increase the volume of enforcement in the city, but not the quality. There's no real traffic, traffic safety, no community policing, no real de-escalation training, and no accountability. I do not feel safe in this city, and I do not feel like my neighbors are safe. Thank you for hearing my concerns yet again. Thank you. Donna? 5.10 is Donna, Donna Dorgan. Um, good evening, council members. My name is Donna Dorgan and I reside here in Jersey City, New Jersey. And I'm here to uh, speak out against ordinance 24-057 uh, regarding the embankment. You know, my, my son played uh, Little League at the Roberto Clemente Field on 6th Street as a child. And uh, I understand that this plan is going to authorize the construction of probably a 50-story hotel high-rise across the street from this Little League field. So the past few weeks, I've been talking with some of my colleagues who live in other communities and asked them, do you think that your municipality would authorize the construction of a 50-story hotel in high-rise 30 feet away from the Little League fields in your towns? And the response to this question is usually shock and disbelief that this sort of development is even being considered. Maybe, maybe it's because in some of these communities, they value their children and uh, want to make sure that they have adequate recreation. I don't think that this plan, which calls for the development of another high rise with high income luxury housing across the street from a little league field where children are supposed to be playing with inadequate parking and more traffic is really a good solution. I understand that this it's been going on for a number of years, but I, I really don't think that this is a good settlement. So I'm asking that you vote against it. Thank you. Kevin Weller. Evening. Good evening. So first, I'd like to uh, start off by talking about this uh, resolution in connection with RealPage. It's uh, first of all something I obviously wholeheartedly agree and I'm glad that you guys are doing this. I'm sure you'll pass it. It makes sense. But I'm, I'm sort of in a unique position here and actually we all are maybe even more so than you may realize related to RealPage. RealPage has some very large lawsuits, class action lawsuits that preceded the Department of Justice um, briefs, statements of interest, and statements of support related to the tenants. I filed one of the largest real estate lawsuits in the history of this country last year, April 7th, which is the real page antitrust and class action lawsuit. I filed that. I'm standing here watching this council likely will pass a resolution because this pricing practice is likely very illegal and there's a criminal probe. In fact, there was recently an FBI raid in Georgia related to this criminal probe. And yet, while we're passing this resolution, this administration, per a conversation I just had with Director Richardson this morning by phone, is allowing so far, they haven't done it yet, hopefully they won't, um, is considering to allow real page a price fixing inflated rents from 2012 to 2016, 
leading up to what was supposed to be the recalculation of what the rent should have been in 2016. So here we're in a situation where apparently the city is contemplating how to let a real page inflated rent um, exceed the rent control, ignore the ordinance chapter 260-1, which defines the legal base rent, which is the rent as it was on January 11th, 1983, plus only those authorized increases thereafter. We understand the look back period that we were awarded by the board is only six years to 2016 and the damages are from then forward. We're fine with that. We're fine with that at this stage. Obviously we're fighting in court for something else, but related to that six year look back, related to the damages that should be calculated from 2016 all the way forward to present is supposed to be, and the board said it and the transcripts reflect, the board never mentioned the word real, um, rollback. They never mentioned rolling back rents. You can read the transcript. They said they ordered a recalculation and the lawyer for the city at the board hearing said to what the rents should have been in 2016. That's different than rolling back to illegal rents. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Tara? Tara? There. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Councilman Solomon again for sponsoring resolution 24496 and in the encouragement of the adoption of the resolution. I'd like to point out that on October 15th, 2023, I was quoted a two bedroom apartment at 70 Green, 998 square feet at $4,525. Today, a nearly identical apartment, only one floor up, is listed at $5,475, $950 more, 21% increase within 35 weeks. One would think that a price increase like that must have been brought on by necessary repairs, major infrastructure, or luxury amenity upgrades. It wasn't. Equity Residential 70 Green Apartment Complex still willfully neglects essential infrastructure maintenance that threatens personal safety and ability to produce an income for oneself by allowing the intrusion of non-tenants squatting in common areas, failing to provide basic security locks at public access points and uniform security guards, failing to maintain HVAC and fire hazard and safety systems, ignoring state agency and local building code violation fees, and of course, still has persistent elevator failures that trap tenants in elevator cars without air conditioning for extended periods of times on days like today in 95 degree heat. What could possibly justify equity to residential raising such massive increases and in asking rents in such a short period? Traditionally, rental prop property values were constrained by the rental income they could bring in. Government sponsored entities only wrote mortgages on multifamily properties that could generate rental income equivalent to 1.25 times the cost of servicing that debt. Banks lent funds to investors looking to renovate apartment buildings in popular areas under the assumption that they'd be able to increase rents, but only if underwriters assume the landlords would achieve a 1.25 debt service coverage ratio required to finance into an agency loan by the time the loan matured. However, RealPage has proven that landlords can grow their rental revenue without making any improvements whatsoever. RealPage baked in eternal rent hyperinflation into the forecasting math of multifamily housing, fueling a dramatic plunge in underwriting standards and the attendant rise in valuations that line the pockets of every manner of real estate speculator in 2021 and 2022. A performance report of more than 200 commercial real estate debt portfolios compiled by a small fund manager and obtained by American Prospect magazine showed that only three funds were eking out enough rent revenue to cover 60% of their debt service, with some generating less than 30% of the income required to cover their interest payments. Insidiously, when these those certain mortgage payments started to skyrocket in 2022 and landlord should have, by conventional mar market logic, been jumping to fill empty apartments. Real Thank, you. Thank you. Jessica? Jessica? Jessica Rizzolo? Hello. 
I can't believe I'm here. I was here for every month for meetings. I missed time with my kids to be here. Y'all know my kids because they were here many times. We came to advocate for your constituents. Life got in the way and I wasn't able to be here for a while. I hated not being here, but I thought it was okay because it's not my job to be here, it's yours. I felt so confident that you would do the right thing. I cannot believe I had to come back. I can't believe Mayor Fulop has the audacity to frame a campaign for governor which centers on affordable housing while he ignores gaslights and censors his constituents who are actively fighting abuse by corporate landlords in direct violation of his city's laws. I'm curious, how many times has Philip been here? How has he acknowledged and addressed the plight of his constituents? And to the council and the rent leveling board? It's not my job to be here. It is yours. Where is our recalc? Where is our protection under the law? What's happening to countless others just like us? And more than that, to those who don't have a voice like ours. How do you have the capacity to run for higher office when you cannot and deliberately choose not to deliver in the job that you currently have? Thank you. Thank you. Brandon? Brandon Cohen? Before I begin, I would like to finish reading Tara, um, Tara Smith's speech because, frankly, it's a good speech. <clears throat> Our rents are not rising because of capital improvements of, in ne or necessary infrastructure repairs and wage inflation. They are rising to cover the gambling losses of equity residential and all manner of large corporate, cor <clears throat> corporate REITs. Now, folks, I did not come here tonight with a prepared speech. I'm sorry. My grandfather died this morning and I'm still grieving. So let's go, let's, don't give me your fucking apologies. Let's actually deal, deal with this shit. Apologies for my oh, language. Wait a minute. I'll keep it under control, I'm profanity. sorry. Yeah, we're okay, not, we're we not gonna go on We won't have profanity, Understood. okay? We can go on to the next speaker. We apologize. That's one thing we're not gonna tolerate, profanity. We respect you guys. We allow y'all to say what you say. There's no need to uh, curse at us, okay? So you need to apologize, you really do. I'm, I'm sorry for my okay. language. Thank you. So I, I come here right now to speak about the, the rent, this process. Right now we are being told the rent is going to be recalculated on 2016, which we have established repeatedly is an illegal rate. And while this is happening, we almost nothing has happened. We've been told, we've been given some assurances that almost always are lies. And we come here every two weeks to speak to you and listen to corporate counsel's answers as they are looking for ties on their computers and browsing other things that do not matter or pertain to their roles. Right now, they're scrolling on their cellular phones and looking on their gaming laptop. I look forward to, a, to one day seeing you guys at a new job, interviewing, explaining how you spent your time, looking for ties and failing to protect your constituents. Goodbye. Thank you. Drew? here? No? Okay. Uh, Shannon? Good evening, council members and fellow residents. I'm here tonight to address a critical issue, the urgent need for proper implementation of the Rent Leveling Board's October 19th, 2023 decision. The board's ruling was clear and unanimous. As we know, our rents must be recalculated, not simply rolled back. This isn't a matter of interpretation. It's a binding decision that must be followed to the letter. So let's talk about and be crystal clear what this means. The recalculation must start from January 11th, 1983, or the first occupancy thereafter, as clearly defined in section 260-1 of the ordinance. And then it must only include increases allowed under all subsections of section 230-3. This means considering factors like proper notifications, 
rent roll registrations and landlord identif identification disclosures. The recalculation cannot simply use 2016 rents as a starting point because those rents were already illegal and using them would perpetuate years of violations. We have heard concerning rumors that the Bureau might be considering shortcuts that would benefit landlords at the expense of tenants. So let me be clear. Any recalculation that doesn't follow the ordinance to the letter is not just wrong, it's illegal. We're also demanding immediate enforcement action. The landlord has been on notice since at least March 19, 2024, when Director Richardson sent a letter clearly outlining the potential for fines and even imprisonment for continued violations, yet illegal increases continue. Each day of non-compliance is a separate offense under the ordinance. The potential fines are they're staggering, potentially millions of dollars. However, this isn't just about that money. It's about accountability and respect for laws. So we call on you, our representatives, to take immediate action as follows. Please ensure that the Bureau conducts a proper ordinance compliant recalculation. Number two, issue summons for all identified violations, as Director Richens has indicated would happen. And three, conduct a thorough investigation into the landlord's practices across all, not just our, but all, all of their Jersey City properties. The integrity of our rent control system is at stake. We're not asking for special treatment. We never have been asking for special treatment. We're demanding that the laws that are on the books be followed. Thank you. Joelle? Members of City Council, over the many meetings we have attended, you, the members of the City Council, have bemoaned the lack of enforcement of myriad ordinances, including traffic issues such as bicycles, motorized bicycles, parking, safety in crosswalks, etc., the failures to file payroll taxes costing the city millions of dollars, and close to my heart, some of you have also raised the issue of the failure to enforce Chapter 260. You've also claimed that you feel for us and have done all that you are able to. Council members, you have failed to exercise one of the most significant powers and requirements of your job, that of investigating the administration and its department's efforts or lack thereof to enforce Jersey City's ordinances. If you continue to rely on legal advice from corporate counsel, I strongly suggest that you are not receiving full advice, secure, independent legal advice. President Waterman, as you have announced your candidacy for mayor, we appreciate your commitment to affordable housing and prevention of homelessness. While enforcement of rent control was not included, we hope that you focus will extend to the, this critical matter of enforcement of all Jersey City ordinances, not just against minorities or the powerless, but most critically against moneyed interests that have perverted Jersey City politics for decades, if not centuries. Enforce the ordinances, please enforce 260. Corporation Council, it has been two weeks and we did not receive the promised rent recalculations. Why not? Another delaying tactic? A realization that sham recalculations would expose the administration to continued public ridicule? This has gone far enough. Thank you. Jessica. Jessica Brand. Good evening, City Council. Um, I'm here to talk about the same fundamental issue that everybody else has been, the lack of transparency and accountability in our rent control uh, calculations and increases. And so for many of us over the years, we've been charged rents without understanding really how they were calculated. And we now know that algorithm driven price fixing will intensify this issue. And it's not just frustrating, it's illegal and a direct violation of our rights as tenants and our rent control ordinance here in Jersey City. 
So let's look at the facts. You've heard some of the details from other speakers, but there are sections in 260 that require landlords to provide tenants with the names and rents of all previous tenants for the last 12 months. So you know if your rent being offered is within the allowable increase range, uh, that hasn't happened. We know that landlords must register rent rolls with the Rent Leveling Bureau to qualify for any increases, period. That has, we've seen no evidence of compliance, nor have I believe you asked for it. Section 9E requires detailed rent roll submissions on official forms, um, like moving dates, prior tenant information, et cetera. Uh, no, no compliance is happening. So this systemic non-compliance isn't just a technicality. It's robbed us of our ability to verify the legality of our rents and has led to years of overcharges. So a comprehensive audit of all rent records from 1998 to the present is really needed. We're asking for you to do that. If the landlord can't provide those records, the Bureau must use its power under the ordinance to determine the legal base rent using available information. And the ordinance does provide multiple options for this, and we know public information is available about those base rents from 1998. Full disclosure of all missing rent registrations and rent roll information to tenants needs to happen. An investigation into why these violations were allowed to persist for so long without enforcement action needs to happen. Implementation of a system to ensure ongoing compliance with all registration and disclosure requirements actually occurs. We know that this isn't happening, happening systematically. You started in 2019 to track this, Councilman Solomon, and I know Council Pre President Waterman, you were involved as well but clearly it hit the brakes. We can do this in the age of information sharing and discovery. To our city officials overall, you know, I'm really, we need to enforce our laws and our, these requirements rigorously. And to tenants, including those here, but those online who are, we know are watching, demand this information, you have a right to it. It's not just your right, and it's crucial to maintain the integrity of our rent control system. And a final thought, when the city opposed our tenants intervention, into the current federal case between equity and Jersey City, I was initially shocked. Now I know it was all a ploy to ensure proper rents will never be known if the city has anything to do with it. Fortunately, we tenants are organized and legally empowered and we will prevail. Thank you. Mark. Good evening, City Council. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, the City's legal department, and John McKinney in particular, for the work on Ordinance 24055, which passed today, clarifying the issue of what is a uniform security guard for a multiple dwelling. Yay! In addition to thanking you, I have two comments. Uh, the changes do clarify the meaning of a uniform security guard. There's no obvious way within these changes that a landlord could continue to claim that a concierge doubles as a uniform security guard. Second, the other changes allow for the input of tenants and tenants associations into the process when ex exemption or renewal of exemption is requested. That's great for us. It used to be only the landlord had input. Now it's much more of a level playing field. Thank you. Now on to something a little more contentious, perhaps. Um, how about the rent recalculation for Portside Towers? 200 days ago, the Rent Leveling Board issued a written order specifying a rent recalculation going back to 2016. It's been dragging to say the least. Two weeks ago on June the 12th, Councilperson Soleil asked the Corporation's Acting Council when the recalculation would be complete. Brittany Murray said, two weeks. That's today. Now we're two weeks on, where is my recalculation? In August 2022, I submitted my original illegal rent petition. In November 2023, the Rent Leveling Board made a decision. In June 2024, now there's nothing. I followed the process. I gave the landlord tenant office everything they asked for when they asked for it. I presented evidence and along with 39 others, we presented evidence to this council in a rather extended session, as you probably remember. So where is my recalculation? I followed the process for two years near enough and we're still waiting. Thank you. Anna? No? Okay. 
Daniel? Imagine a kid getting bullied at school. Every day, the bully takes the kid's lunch money. The kid goes to the teacher for help, and the teacher says, I'll look into it. Months go by. The bully is still taking the kid's lunch money. The kid comes back to the teacher and asks, uh, hello, can you do more? The teacher then sends a letter to the bully asking him to stop taking the kid's lunch money and does nothing else. Then the kid goes to the principal and asks, can you look into why the teacher isn't helping or can you just do something? The principal says nothing. The kid goes to the principal every other week, Wednesday evenings at 8.05, 8.10 p.m. Occasionally, the principal says he'll do something, but he never does. Now, in this story, us residents are the kids. Equity residential is the bully. The Office of Landlord-Tenant Relations is the teacher. And the principal is many of, of you council members and acting corporate counsel, Brittany Murray. And instead of our lunch money, it's thousands of dollars. Corporate Council Murray, when Council Member Gilmore questioned you last city council meeting on what can be done about equity continuing to raise rents, despite the fact that they're out of compliance with 260, you told him that it goes on a case by case basis. So each individual has to file an illegal rent petition. Many of us residents have submitted illegal rent petitions. The first one was submitted in spring of 2022. And when we submit an illegal rent petition, that goes to the Office of Landlord-Tenant Relations. They are the ones who are in charge of the calculations that have taken eight months. It makes no logical sense for each of us to file an illegal rent petition. We've established that the Office of Landlord-Tenant Relations are the ones dropping the ball here. They know what's going on, and the reason they haven't taken any action is not because of a lack of illegal rent petitions. In my opinion, in my opinion, it's because they don't want our building to be rent controlled, because if they did, we wouldn't have to keep coming here week after week. It's become apparent that there's a web of corruption in the city. Council members, I ask you, do you want to be a part of this web of corruption? When you look back 10, 20, 30 years down the line, when you're retired and everyone's forgotten about this, has forgotten about this evening, do you want to look back then and think, yeah, I enabled the bully. That's it. Thank you. Erin? Erin Kent? Good evening, council members. My name is Erin Kent. I was thrilled to read the article in the Hudson County View, which said that most of the members of this council support a resolution to ban the use of RealPage and any software that artificially inflates rent. Councilman Solomon was quoted as saying, it's no secret that rents across the country, especially right here in Jersey City, are at untenable highs. But to know that this housing crisis was in part artificially created, that landlords and developers are essentially colluding to jack up rent prices for everyone else is a slap in the face. I really appreciate these words and I thank Councilman Solomon for leading the charge. But when you've listened to our pleas every two weeks since, I don't know, November 2022, I only got involved last year, only to give little to no real tangible support, saying it's a slap in the face is just essentially lip service. I want to make it clear that I'm addressing the city council as a government body, not Council uh, Solomon in particular. We appreciate any support in this matter, even if it's generalized beyond our specific situation at Portside to Jersey City and the state of New Jersey as a whole. However, this entire Hudson County View article reads like a manifesto for Portside Tower's tireless work for everything we have practically begged for over the course of almost two years. That rent is untenable, that rent is the result of unchecked abuse of power, that working families are suffering every day trying to make ends meet, that there is a housing crisis wreaking havoc on our communities, that this is plain and simple predatory, it is exploitation. So now we can 
ostensibly say that both parties agree, but really all I see as I look out here is a glaring case of cognitive dissonance. You say you are on our side, the words in this article at least really sound that way, then why don't your actions align? Why aren't you enforcing Chapter 260, an ordinance that was literally made to protect the tenants in this very city? We know why. Okay, then why the sudden show of force against the villains we've blatantly been calling out all along? Is it because things are getting just a little bit too sticky? The FBI rating real page, a bullet in the side of one of the towers, and to be honest, I'm not up on the latest on that, but it certainly does look shady. Is all of this claiming you are on our side while not actually enforcing the law, is all of this to save face? Or is it legitimate care and a willingness to help the people you were elected to protect? If it's the latter, here's a little tip. Enforcing Chapter 260 right here in Jersey City would be a surefire way to put your money where your mouth is. Thank you. David, David Wilson. Good evening. I live at Portside Towers. It's not a big surprise. And in a few days, I'm going to be paying July rent. I'm going to be paying an illegally high rent. Um, the rent leveling board determined six months ago or so that my building was rent controlled and that the rents had to be recalculated. Um, that hasn't happened. In fact, my rent has actually gone up. There was a further illegal rent increase in April. Um, this is a significant amount of money that is is that I'm paying every month. You know, um, it's not a theoretical thing. Um, two weeks ago, we were told that the recalculation was going to be complete and it's not complete. So setting aside the question of whether the recalculation was going to be done properly or not. Actually, nothing has been done at all. So, so to date, there's been zero enforcement of the board's decision. Um, I support the proposed state law to prohibit the use of rent setting algorithms. Um, having said that, you know, let's enforce the laws that we have now. Um, you know, you have uh, you, the, the Office of Landlord Tenant uh, Relations is not doing their job and I don't know why they're not doing it. I'm not going to ascribe ill intent to anybody um, and it doesn't actually matter. They're not doing it. Um, and so you have a legal mechanism to require them to do their jobs and uh, I ask you to use that and to take action now. Thank you. Thank you. Council President, can I just provide an update? before the next speaker, is that okay? Sure. Sorry, it's me. Um, just very quickly, um, obviously the recalculations are not yet done. I provided the council with the update as to where we're at. I know Director Richardson has been speaking to you all about where they're at. We're at um, five years of base rent calculations completed. We've added additional personnel to it. There was a few more people added, um, so they are working on it. And then in terms of anybody, they do not have to file an illegal rent petition. Director Richardson is accepting their previous lease, their new lease, and proof of payment. And then he's going to make a determination from there, so they do need to submit it. I know he was speaking to some of the tenants about it already this morning. Kevin, he was speaking to you, right? Because that's what he email. Okay. So you can inform some of the tenants also the information that he needs. Okay. Okay. And then I'll find out. So he just got additional staff. It's legal issue. Right, right. He just got additional staff. Brittany, he just got additional staff, right? Okay. He did, yes. Okay. So I wanted to make sure. All right. Go ahead. Next one. I just want. Suzanne. Hi. Um, I'm very, you know, annoyed tonight because, again, Two weeks ago, we said recalculations were happening. I was told before this meeting that Richardson said they want to roll back rents to 2016, not a recalculation. Brittany Murray just said they have hired people to do a recalculation. It is very confusing. It is very misleading. And I feel lied to, misled, and disrespected at this point 
because let's review the timeline of events. I've been in this group since I think May of 2022. We had an October 19th decision that we should be rent controlled in the East Tower and Portside Towers. It is now June, almost July 1st. We are still at this. We were also told a few months ago by Brittany Murray that there was no stay in the decision made by the Rent Leveling Bureau. And yet Portside Ta oh, sorry, Equity has is issued us continuously illegal rents. They have misled new tenants, existing tenants. There has been no enforcement by the city to prevent any wrongdoing since October decision. What kind of faith can I have that what I have just heard is actually true? What are they actually doing? We haven't had a meeting with the tenants. I have done everything asked of me as well as everyone here. Respectfully, I have submitted my uh, illegal rent petition. I have paid my rent every month, illegal rent. My renewal is apparently due in five days, which is not true. My rent, I think, is July 28th or something. And when we talk about respect, how is it respectful that you all are not, the city is not following the law when we have followed the law ourselves? What kind of respect is that for us? We come here every two weeks to talk about the same thing and other evidence and, and we'll follow your asks, but we aren't getting that in return. It is constant tactics to delay. So to hear a positive update, is it a positive update? Is it real? When will we see real? I have nothing real to tangible in my hand, in my wallet, on my, my account for my rent. Does everyone, I mean, then we have a few weeks ago, these people on this side voting for a law firm of, with a huge conflict of interest to represent the city. Again, what kind of respect is that for this group that is trying to fight for tenants in Jersey City and in Portside Towers to have our own laws followed? What kind of investigation has happened? It's been silent since we brought this up. Is there an investigation? Thank you. Thank you. Derek, Derek Stack. In council. It's been a few weeks since uh, since I last spoke. Um, I only got involved speaking here a few months ago, but uh, that already feels like a pretty absurd amount of time to be coming back and repeating the same things over and over again. And uh, just from what I've heard in the few minutes I've been here tonight, my takeaway is I need to get out of the private sector because, man, if I could uh, just get away with saying things, not following up on them and being wrong about a lot of the things I say, that would be a pretty sweet gig to have. Anyway, here's my, uh, here's my speech that I wrote. Despite the rent leveling board's clear determination, our landlord continues to defy this ruling, leaving tenants vulnerable and without the protections we are legally entitled to. When we brought this issue to the city's attention, we were hopeful that swift and decisive action would be taken. The rent leveling board's review unequivocally ruled in favor of us, the tenants, confirming that our landlord does not meet the exemption criteria. Yet despite this ruling, no substantial action has been taken to compel compliance with Ordinance 260. Our landlord continues to ignore the law and we continue to suffer the consequences. It is disheartening to hear the city and government officials speak or post on social media about their commitment to protecting renters, knowing that these words have yet to translate into any meaningful action. And by meaningful action, I don't mean campaign speak and passing easy, easily palatable, popular and toothless resolutions. Renters make up a significant portion of your constituents, and while we appreciate the words of support, we need more than just words. We need action. The ongoing inaction not only undermines our trust in the system, but perpetuates the hardships we face every month. There are clear steps that the city can take and must take to rectify the situation. Firstly, it is imperative to fine the landlord for their noncompliance with the rent control ordinance. This not only serves as a deterrent to our bad actor landlord, but sends a strong message to others that the city will not tolerate violations of tenant rights. Secondly, an investigation should be launched. We've heard that there may be one, but of course, no action. Because we need to understand what are the barriers to, you know, why isn't this not happening? Where's the, where's the inaction uh, originating? We need to hold those accountable for, the, for their interaction. And I know that might be the hard thing to do. 
we it's easy to do the easy things and say the right things and pass resolutions but the hard thing is to ask difficult questions to people in power and i it's not just on us to do that it's also on you guys to do that our community is counting on you the council the council has had ample time and numerous opportunities to address the issue yet we are still waiting for justice the time for action is now our plight is not just a legal matter but a moral one We ask that you stand by your words, show your commitment to renters, and take necessary steps to ensure our rights are protected. We urge you to act decisively and swiftly, fine our landlord for the blatant disregard for the law, and initiate an investigation into the lack of enforcement. Show us that the city council stands with us, the renters, not just in words, but in action. Thank you. Shellhurst. Tonight, my speech is personal. Joel and I just signed our lease renewal last week and we'll be paying more rent than we were paying when we won at the rent leveling board. And yesterday marks the two year anniversary of when I submitted our illegal rent petition. For two years, I've been waiting for tangible justice in the form of money due back to me and my family for our rent overpayments and a rent reduction back to our unit's legal rate. The total overpayment since we moved to Portside is money that's been stolen from us, money that my husband and I work hard to earn. That money doesn't belong to anyone other than us. Two years and no relief, and not one Jersey City public servant in this room or beyond has chosen to step away from mediocrity that is Jersey City's business as usual backroom dealings, or they'll just eventually go away, or we'll dangle some shiny things to distract them, which I'm going to call lies, such as the bogus Dinah Hendon investigation that took place in the dark via a closed meeting, to telling us it's an eight week period before approval of a perfectly good form that we developed to help the city enforce rent control, only for it to never be mentioned by you again. To city attorneys in direct dereliction of their duty to answer basic questions of law, hiding behind the phrases pending litigation and the real doozy of not knowing if anyone is planning litigation. Also, the city's attorneys attempting to unethically appoint one of the mayor's political donors as outside counsel to our case. Three unethical attempts. And the last meeting, four of you voted to approve the unethical resolution. How are we supposed to trust you? Our landlord has stolen our money. Our landlord lied in our leases. My landlord has flaunted your laws right under your nose. For a second time in this chamber, with all due respect, President Waterman, I have to say that I disagree that you've done all you can do. I can only believe that you're knowingly allowing yourselves to be kept in the dark and putting your faith in the hands of the city attorneys to take care of the portside manor. But if there's anyone you should trust and listen to, believe me, it's us. We've told you nothing but the truth. President Waterman, you're the leader of the council and you haven't stuck your neck out like you're truly willing to expose what's happening to us. It was June 25th, 2022. I reported to the city that my landlord is stealing from us and because not one of you has stepped up and shown true fearless leadership, equity continues to steal from me and my family every month. Stop the crime that you're enabling. Make today the day that you stop participating in the duplicitous plot against us. Thank you. Carol. I, I have literally nothing planned. For today, um, just chicken scratch as everybody's been talking because it occurred to me, you know, we're on this WhatsApp thread and there's some of us that feel quite a lot of anxiety about being here, concerned about what they should say, if they're prepared enough, you know, apologizing if they didn't do a good enough representing us. And I think that's all crazy because this isn't supposed to be some kind of performance. This isn't supposed to be a presentation contest. 
we're not supposed to be clapping and cheering because you did a great speech job. We're supposed to be here to like make some kind of change. And I'm getting incredibly frustrated that I've been here since October. And so how about this? I've, I've just learned that the five years of calculations have been completed. So when will we receive our, uh, you know, pay, rents, overpayments? When will we receive those? What's the timeline for that? What, so what what am I not asking? Like, what's the right question that I should be asking so I can get some kind of response? I think- You wanna know the timeline. That's what she asked me, it's a simple question. We're not gonna be able to answer that. There's two lawsuits and I expect okay. two more after the recalculations come out. I'm not, we're not the people that can give that to them. There's no way to tell. So, but Brittany, the um, I think we there's a lot of confusion going on here. So, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong. The actual process in which people will start getting money that's in the court's jurisdiction. We're not dealing with that now, correct? Now, I guess the the bigger question, which seems to be the elephant in the room, so to say, is. Are we looking to do a rollback or freeze? No, that's or, I mean, a recalculation. Councilman or rollback. Uh, Director Richardson is doing his recalculation. Oh, so is Once it re he has it, they're able to challenge it. That's all we can say. And then the third thing is all of them who submit the previous lease with the new lease, um and I forget it was one more item that was requested. The landlord would be given the infraction per resident who turn in these leases and things, right? Director Richardson will review them and if it's um viable, he'll he can issue a violation, correct? Or each unit lease that's provided. Yeah, timeline on the, the review. <laughs> He said she couldn't. She said she couldn't give the answer. Yeah, I'm going. She yeah, said, I guess. Oh, you want a timeline, but she said she couldn't give an answer. I, I want to have to do something for Director Richardson if you want to have a chat with him about it. Yeah, because I think, in all fairness to Director Richardson, he's not here to answer questions directly, and he's doing the actual calculations and everything. Um, so I'm going to reach out and see if we can. Um, set up time, some type of meeting just to specifically discuss that element right there, um, where we start and add and how that calculation is going to look. Liv, Liv Malone. Hi, everybody. Tonight, I want to introduce my neighbors who will be speaking on their experience living at 429 Bergen Avenue. While you hear their accounts, I want to remind this council that our landlord doesn't have an annual landlord registration statement nor rent control exemption on file. We are looking forward to scheduling a date with the Office of Code Compliance to show in person what you'll hear about today. Thank you, Councilwoman Prinzeri, for helping make this happen. Also, the speaker after me is not present. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to um, Eva Smith. Hey, I didn't really prepare anything and I'm not really good of a speaker. So I'm actually just coming up to just speak about my experience at 429. Um, I've been living in the building for five years. I am a mom and I do work and it's going to get tough very soon once my lease has to be renewed. Um, it's very high. I do not mind sometimes like living in the type of building that I live in, but it's a lot of problems. So if you are going to continue to raise the rent, there's so much in the building that is not being done. I lived there five years. Nothing's going on, no repairs, nothing new. Things are stolen, windows are leaking. Um, it's ruining like my home. Like it's literally causing lots of problems like AC, 
is right underneath my window that leaks that can you know cause for like electricity to go off i do have a young son um it's it's a lot going on in the building my main concern is that it's going up my rent is just raising and raising and i felt at one point i had nothing to do or could do nothing about it until i met Liv. so thankful to her i just feel like it's really it's just my main concern is it's very expensive and i'm gonna start to struggle a bit mm. And I wish that it can be controlled, especially the type of building that it is, like falling apart. Yeah. You know, that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Deron Shield. I'm also from 429. Um, and I'm also here to speak on my experience and about Ordinance Chapter 260. So my rent went up $175 last year and threatening to go up an additional $375 later this year because of market rate. I have seen so much mess with this landlord is preposterous. After signing my lease, a non-smoking agreement and a parking agreement, I walked into my apartment dirty, cigarette butts in the kitchen sink and was told I didn't have parking because there, no, there were no more parking spots. So I was really bamboozled. I tried to leave the place but was told I had to pay an additional $2,000 to get out of the lease plus I had to find a new tenant for them. So I decided to deal with it because I could not afford to move again or pay additional $2,000 because I moved in from another state and I paid a broker's fee. There's a government agency occupying the first floor of my building, the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy recruitment centers who occupy half of the garage. Because of this, it has increased the population using the tenant entrance and our amenities. Things like this is not fair to the tenants who live in the building because it's unknown traffic in and out of the building, which means you really don't know who belongs and who doesn't. Just to give you some more insight into the type of building this is, here's a rundown of issues we constantly have to endure. Packages being stolen, bikes being cut and stolen, smelling other people's bowel movements through the non-working ventilation systems in the building, non-working washer dryers or cooling systems, damaged ceilings from rainfall, and I'm not on the top floor, fly infestations, red clover mites, break-ins in my car in a private garage, standing outside at 3 a.m. in the morning because the fire alarm randomly goes off, random drug users roaming into the building and sleeping in the lobby, and most of all, the hefty bug infestation, which has ruined all my pretty appliances. They told me the reason I have bugs is because I'm not home to get an exterminated and my neighbors are being exterminated, and that's why I have bugs. They added a water bill last year and installed water sensors on our toilets because they claim we're using too much water, which is not fair because this bill is a flat rate and not based on the amount of water we use in the apartment. This company does not deserve to enforce any rent increases, let alone gouging rents for tenants because they're not holding up their end of the, the agreement. Thank you. Excuse me. Joyce. This is it's part of 429 and we have inspectors going over there. 429 and we have inspectors going over there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Same. Yeah, it's the same. She's 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 familiar with the building. So I council president asked the address, so I gave her an update on what we're doing on our end. And Brittany's gonna get with you guys right now. So Daniel? Here. Oh, Daniel? Daniel? Is Daniel here? You there? Daniel Odell? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Hello, Council, uh, especially Councilman Saleh. And thank you for taking time tonight to listen to everyone here. Uh, my name is Daniel. My wife and I live in the Heights, specifically the Western Slope, where we don't have a car. I'm here to ask that you make the Manhattan Franklin bike lane permanent and recommit to what the city has already promised, a comprehensive bike route from the Heights on down to Greenville. I've seen the city's bike master plan, and uh, it's hard to find, but it looks great. Our city has one of the lowest vehicle ownership rates in the country. 75% of households have zero to one cars. 
that means that a super majority of us live either as my wife and I do without a car or as my neighbors Charlie and Amanda do, sharing a single car, which they'll both share with their daughter when she's old enough to drive. In other words, on any given day, most of us rely on something other than a car to get around. And let's face it, if you don't own a car and you don't live downtown, our city isn't built for you. Transit is infrequent and most of our arterial roads are dangerous on a bike. We're waiting on Trenton for better transit, but we're waiting on you for bike lanes. Within Jersey City, my bike is how I get around. And to get here tonight, I had to navigate a risky patchwork of unprotected bike lanes and roads without any bike lanes where the vast majority of drivers respectfully share the road, but where once every few months, a bully tries to seriously hurt me. I'm stubborn, but most people aren't. Another neighbor who couldn't be here tonight said that back in his home country, he biked everywhere, but I quote, I would never bike in Jersey City. My wife, after one run-in with a road bully, effectively swore off biking. Uh, they were literally run off the road. My wife has said that if we have children, she wouldn't feel safe letting them bike. Uh, I spent most of my childhood on a bike, and that breaks my heart. I don't think this is the kind of city that any of us wants. Now, to be clear, I don't see this as a war between cyclists and motorists, as some would have you think. In fact, I think parking coexists beautifully with bike lanes as it does on Columbus Drive, where bike lanes are protected by parked cars instead of concrete barriers. I don't own a car, but I have um, I don't own a car, but I have a driver's license. I drive, and when I drive, I prefer to drive separated from cyclists rather than sharing a lane with bikes weaving in and out of traffic. My neighbors Charlie and Amanda own a car and want bike lanes. Our friends Andrew and Sarah in Bergen Lafayette, uh, who couldn't be here tonight because of uh, work and childcare, also own a car and asked me to tell you that they fully support the Manhattan Franklin bike lane. Council, do you think that outside downtown, our city is built fairly for people who can't or don't want to drive every day? If your answer is yes, I challenge you to live without a car for a month or a week. If your answer is an honest no, what are you waiting for? Thank you. Thank you. Tony. Thank you, Tony Borelli, Vice President of Bike JC. Uh, I'd like to thank this council and Mayor Phillips administration for your continued and wise support of the ongoing pilot of the very first protected bike lane in the grid of the Heights neighborhood proper. You have no doubt heard by now some uh, earnest, yet we believe misinformed comments objecting to the project. You've heard about um, anonymous groups of citizens who suddenly are concerned about chaos in our streets. Uh, I think you're a little late, folks. Uh, seen keyboard warriors hurling insults and even threats in our direction. And people standing on curbs and scowling at small children riding bikes. We have a message for all of you. Uh, should you encounter them, interact with them on your travels? And that is that some of them seem to think that we're going to go away, that we can be brushed off, discouraged, outworked, outlasted. We can't and we won't. We won't because dirty little secret, Bike JC hasn't put in easily 50,000 hours of volunteer work all without compensation for nearly 15 years because we like bikes. We do, but we do it because we know that projects just like this one save lives. They save people from being violently killed, sickened, disabled by crashes, by car exhaust, by all the ills of a transportation system dominated by cars. But even beyond that, we literally can't stop. And that's because of what happens every November. And I think a lot of you are aware of this and have been there with us. But we stand in what's often a sprightly freezing drizzle and we install bikes and shoes painted white in memory of the people slaughtered on our streets, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones. And standing with us are the people they left behind. And those people look at us and you with haunted eyes 
and they make us promise never to stop. If somebody arguing about their parking space has a similarly high moral ground to stand on, uh, I, I find that remarkable. And um, I, I don't think that, um, that that's going to prevail. I, I think we will because we've promised them we would always keep up this fight until it's won. We won't stop, and indeed we can't stop, and we never will. And we urge you to support us every step of the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adrian? Is Adrian here? Good evening, council members. Uh, I'm Adrian Orozco, the New Jersey political director for 32BJ SCIU. And um, I'd like to speak on item 10.23 on uh, algorithmic uh, rent setting monopolies. Um, 32BJ represents over 1,000 Jersey City building service workers. Over 1,000 of our locals members live right here in Jersey City. We're currently organizing an additional uh, over a thousand building service workers in Jersey City's residential buildings. Uh, you just heard from two of those workers uh, and they're currently attempting to organize a union in their work sites. Uh, these workers aren't only denied decent wages and benefits by contractors hired by Jersey City's largest landlords, but they're also suffering from a cost of living crisis exacerbated by the same landlords who are allegedly colluding to raise rents. Landlords, along with property tech companies like RealPage and Yardi, are now subject to multiple lawsuits and investigations, including a criminal investigation of RealPage by the Department of Justice. Major Jersey City residential landlords like Equity Residential, Brookfield, and Kushner Real Estate are defendants accused of colluding through the use of rent setting algorithms. Landlords set rents based on a huge amount of centralized real time rent data, which they provide to RealPage and Yardi. RealPage executives boast that the software allows landlords to raise rents by up to 14.5%. Dozens of major landlords, along with prop tech companies, Real Page and Yardi, now face high profile lawsuits alleging centralizing pricing schemes are resulting in rent gouging. The industry is charged with breaking antitrust law by combining proprietary data from would be competitors and colluding to inflate rents. Use of the rent pricing software appears to be endemic right here in Jersey City. We found data from at least 70 Jersey City buildings. That's 20,500 units listed on the RealPage database, suggesting that those owners shared their data to use the tool. Landlords named in the lawsuits include Equity Residential, Brookfield, Gray Star, KRE, who all own buildings in Ward E and F. Uh, Jersey City residents pay some of the highest rents in the country. Uh, it's long-term uh, residents, mostly people of color, who are forced out of Jersey City by luxury development. Their affordability crisis is worsened uh, by the portion of the housing market distorted by anti-competitive forces. Thank you to the council and uh, lead sponsor Solomon for uh, bringing this Thank to you. the council. Robert? Thank you for this time. Uh, my name is Robert Matthew Fretz, and I'm a resident of the Heights, specifically Manhattan Ave between Central and Summit. I'm here to speak in support of making permanent the bike lanes on Manhattan and Franklin. These bike lanes have been a lightning rod for pent up frustration on everything from traffic to paving to street sweeping. These are legitimate concerns, and I share many of them, but they have nothing to do with these particular bike lanes. 
To my neighbors in the council, our traffic problem is largely driven by cut through traffic. Our parking problem is not going to go away so long as our housing keeps getting denser and people feel they need a car. If we do nothing to look to the future, it's just going to keep getting worse regardless of who is sitting on the council or serving as mayor. Last night, there was hardly any traffic on Manhattan due to Rock the Block shutting down the turn to ferry to get downtown and to the tunnel. Without a block party every night, uh, we are going to have to find solutions that work for locals. Part of our solution should be putting in the in infrastructure uh, for folks like me who are physically able and would prefer to leave the car home feeling safe to do so. I've been riding around the neighborhood as well as downtown for the better part of 15 years. To some, that makes me a new guy. Uh, while I do drive uh, for commuting and running errands, I find riding to be faster. It's liberating and gets time back. But for many er errands, uh, the moment I bring uh, one of my children is the moment I'm driving. My own kids uh, have both learned to ride over the last 14 months. Some of you have probably seen us using or building the bike lanes. Uh, we're riding to and from school or over to Riverview. In general, I felt safer having them ride around Hoboken, Union City, or downtown than our own neighborhood. In the Heights, they're largely on sidewalks for safety. In other places, they are in bike lanes or side streets that don't double as drag strips. Now is the time for us to look to the future and put infrastructure in place to make it safer to get around the neighborhood and the rest of Jersey City. As our housing gets denser, we can choose to have residents believe they need a car or we can choose to have them feel safe without one. As we look at eight to 10 years of more traffic being pushed into our neighborhood during the turnpike extension construction, we can choose to have infrastructure in place now for locals to get around while our guests are stuck in traffic, or we can choose to simply be gridlocked with them. Better infrastructure leads to more families like mine leaving the car home and not or not having one to begin with. This turns into less cars and traffic and more parking at destinations. I support the Manhattan and Franklin bike lanes because of my kids, my neighbor's kids, and the old guy going to work every morning with his lunch pail on his shoulder. All our neighbors deserve safety when they're trying to get where they are going. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sandy, Sandy Jacoby. No. Um, last name is Patel Div Div Divine. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the first name. Last name is Patel. No. Okay. Um, Colin. Colin. Hey, Council. Um, I wanted to come to voice my support for all new protected bike lanes. Uh, and thank Councilwoman Prinzeri and Councilwoman Saleh in particular for the newest ones on Mallory Ave on the west side and Manhattan and Franklin Avenues in Jersey City, City Heights. The new lanes are great and they should be made permanent. And I echo everything the previous speaker said about density uh, and getting around using alternatives other than cars. Uh, that's super important in a growing city that's increasingly um, getting denser and denser with much new development. Uh, bike lanes help build sustainable, walkable, and bikeable communities, but also give you a new perspective on communities and businesses. I discovered Alessio's while riding my, my bike on Franklin the other day. Um, protected bike lanes are more about bikes Slower, narrow, narrower streets are better for pedestrians and drivers. They promote placemaking. We do not have a bike lane problem. We have a traffic enforcement problem. It's worth reminding that 40% of households here do not have a car. It's hard for some people to, who have cars to fathom that, but uh, there is a large group of people here that do not use a car to get around the city. I walk and bike around a lot. And the problem is plain to see. Public safety in this town is frankly a disgrace. People do not feel safe getting around. I challenge any one of you 
to really reflect hard, stand on the corner someday in your ward and just watch drivers. Our only saving grace for safe spaces has been infrastructure. But we all know those improvements take a lot of time. There are police officers on the street today, right now. Stand on any corner for 20 minutes. You'll see a car run a red light, a stop sign, text or talk while they're driving with one hand on the wheel, the other hand on their phone, drive 10 plus miles over the speed limit, myriad other things. Probably some of them are under the influence. Then there's 9-11, 911. A neighbor, a friend, and a fellow advocate was hit by an aggressive driver while on his bike. He called 911, this is recent, but no one picked up. It was hard to get through to someone. Then there's parking enforcement. They are just not issuing enough tickets. People are double parking, parking on corners and crosswalks all day long, everywhere. Parking is, illegal parking is a safety issue. If you can't see the cars coming from the corner, they can't see you and you're, in, you're at risk given the driving conditions that we see every day on the street. Thank you. Aiko? Excuse me. My name is Aiko Laboria, and I'm the founder of the Flow Initiative. This evening, however, I speak with immense gratitude in my capacity as secretary of the Jersey City Women's Advisory Board. I extend my thanks to Mayor Fulop and Council President Waterman for the support of my reappointment. I'm hopeful that the Council will recognize the significance of the work we have undertaken. Over the past two years, the Women's Advisory Board has been steadfast in its mission, not only by organizing workshops, town halls, and listening sessions, but also by keenly analyzing the myriad of stories shared by the diverse women of Jersey City. These narratives reflect a tapestry of challenges and triumphs underscoring the need for robust, actionable change. My own journey has involved collaborating with the governor, state legislators, and numerous community organizations to advocate and secure the passage of six menstrual equity bills in a single year. This advocacy has fundamentally transformed landscape for women, girls, and individuals across New Jersey, reinforcing the critical importance of policy and driving change. This brings me to CEDAW, the United Nations Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. CEDAW offers a comprehensive framework for municipalities like Jersey City to safeguard women from discrimination and dismantle oppressive systems that obstruct their progress. The women of Jersey City deserve policy, not promises. Policies create lasting change by establishing clear guidelines and standards that shape our city's future, while promises fall often short. The distinction is clear. Programs are vital operational initiatives that address immediate needs, but policies set the enduring rules and frameworks that govern our actions and commitments. The women of Jersey City have earned policies that uplift and advance them every day, not just during election cycles or in response to crises like domestic violence. Women deserve more than token gestures. They deserve a future where their needs are continually addressed and their voices amplified. CEDAW offers this future by providing a structure to ensure ongoing support and equity. The women of Jersey City need a champion, someone that can advocate for them in the most influential rooms. In the coming weeks, the Women's Advisory Board looks forward to engaging with you and advancing the next steps towards this crucial framework. I also urge the Council to rectify the oversight that has denied the Women's Advisory Board a place on the Jersey City website for the past two years. This omission sends a message that uh, of our, our city's priorities. Just as the Cannabis Board has a presence, despite it being a volunteer advisory group, so too should the Women's Advisory Board. Is the implication that we take precedence over women's issues in Jersey City? I trust we can work towards a positive change in this regard. Let us work together to create a city that women are valued, supported, and empowered every day. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Isla?
Good evening, Ayla Shermer, president of Bike JC, an advocacy organization working towards a safe and bike friendly Jersey City. I'm here to voice my and Bike JC's full support for the pop up protected bike lanes that were installed earlier this month on Manhattan Ave and Franklin Street. These are the very first protected bike lanes in the Heights neighborhood, which is very exciting. Despite a growing movement for improved street safety in this area, the Heights remains a critical missing link in the city's protected bike lane network. Manhattan and Franklin were selected for this demonstration project in accordance with the city's bicycle master plan, which this council unanimously uh, adopted in 2009 after much study and tremendous community input. These two streets serve as an important east-west connection linking nearby schools, parks, grocery stores, and more. There have been 10 crashes resulting in an injury on this very short corridor in the last five years, seven of which involved pedestrians and cyclists. This cannot continue, and this street redesign will help ensure that it doesn't. Not only does it give cyclists a dedicated safe space, but it calms traffic speeds by narrowing the road. The people who stand to benefit most from this safety project are people who you will likely never hear from, perhaps because they don't speak English or because they don't have the luxury of time to come here and speak at a city council meeting. But as someone deeply entrenched in Jersey City's cycling community, I can assure you that there is an enormous base of support for this project who is very appreciative of this critical first step towards a safer Heights neighborhood and a safer Jersey City. And we do hope that this is just a first step. Next, we'd like to see not only a permanent installation of this project, but that it ultimately connects to a protected north-south bike lane, which remains another crucial hole in the citywide network. With my remaining time, I'd like to do some quick myth busting about this project. Myth number one, the project will produce Carmageddon type gridlock. Fact, it has actually been the exact opposite. Uh, residents along the project corridor have seen much less traffic, and even folks who were initially very skeptical are now thoroughly enjoying their newly trafficked calm streets. Myth number two, emergency vehicles will not be able to pass through. Fact, city officials have repeatedly observed ambulances and full-size fire trucks navigating without issue, just as they do on the city's hundreds of other one-way streets. And myth number three, the bike lanes are empty. Fact, this is a common misconception about active transportation infrastructure. Bikes are small, nimble, and extremely efficient. They take up next to no space and they don't get caught in traffic. So their presence doesn't always register. But if you stand along these or any bike lane for maybe 10 minutes, you'll see just how much use they actually get. As one of the city's many car-free residents and daily bike lane users, I am very grateful that we are providing safe options for clean and healthy modes of travel, and I look forward to permanent implementation. Thank you. Anne? Is there an Anne here? We are done with the public speaking portion of our meeting. And to our petitions and communications, six items, 6.1 to 6.42. Are there any questions, comments? Okay, officers communications, item 7.1 and 7.2. Any questions or comments? Board of directors. Items 8.1 to 8.14. Are there any questions? Okay, um, we will move on to our claims and addendum. One, two, and three. Your vote for claims and addendum numbers. One, two, and three. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bajiano is not here. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Stepped away. Okay. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. 
OK, um, I will recap the vote once Councilperson Gilmore comes back to the room. Um, on to our resos, I'll let John Metro speak. Uh, yeah, we, uh, Council, we're just going to pull one. It's uh, 1064, one of the law firm uh, um, resolutions. We have to update the account number, so it's just a clerical issue, but we'll, we'll resolve it by next meeting. OK, so we'll move on to our resolutions. We're taking a vote on items 10.1 to 10.11. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bajiano is not here. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson, okay. Councilperson Dejis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Uh, items 10.23 to 10.26. Uh, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye, Paul. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Saleh. Aye, for all. Councilperson Solomon. Uh, just what number are we going to? Um, this is 10.23 and 10.26 because we earlier voted on 10.13 to 10.22. For sure, and um, uh, I for all on 10.23, just thank you to all my colleagues uh, for the co-sponsorship on this resolution and thank you to both the Portside Tower Tenants and 32BJ for raising this uh, really, really important issue. Um, rents truly are going through the roof in Jersey City, in New Jersey and, and across the country. And what, the investigations into both RealPage and other similar softwares have revealed is that billion dollar corporations are in essence creating a cartel. They are sharing information with each other to artificially raise rents. And then these software actually penalizes the landlords if they try to lower set, set a lower rent, right? Um, and it's the absolute opposite of what a free market is. It's the absolute opposite of what uh, competition is supposed to bring, but it is what greed brings, and um, it is harming lots of people throughout our city. And so what the hope of this resolution is, is that um, there's going to be legislation introduced in Trenton. Um, that's the state is, I think, where we can take action, and we want to really build momentum behind it. And so uh, the hope here is that this is the first of many, many municipalities that take this on um, across the state of New Jersey, that momentum builds in Trenton, and then ultimately real reform is passed uh, to restore, you know, basic, uh, you know, fairness in the way that rents are set. Um, so we're excited to, to see this move forward here at the council, and we'll keep kind of banging the drum on this and move forward. So with that, I for all. Thank you, Councilperson Gilmore. We're voting on 10.23 to 10.26. 10.23. So 10.26? Yes, just a three. We previously voted on 10.13 to 10.22. Oh, okay. Aye. Thank you. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera? Aye. Council President Waterman? Aye. Okay, uh, items 10.23, 10.26 are approved 7-0. Councilperson Gilmore? Councilperson Gilmore, may I have your vote for uh, the addendums number one, two, and three, please? Aye. Thank you. So the addendum and claims one, two, and three, they are approved and zero. And Councilperson Gilmore, may I have your vote on items 10.1 and 10.11? 10.12 was voted on earlier. 10.1 through 10.11. Aye. Thank you. Okay, so items 10.1 to 10.11 are approved 7-0. Okay, uh, on to items 10.21, uh, 10.27 to 10.40. Council Person Ridley? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. You switching places with me? <laughs> Aye. Okay, Council Person Prinzeri? 
Anytime you go in a reverse order, I'm sure I have no problem with it. <laughs> Councilperson Bacciano is not here. Councilperson Saleh. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Where, where are we going up to? Uh, 10.27 to 1040. Uh, I vote aye on 1028. I want to congratulate Laura Takuri as the uh, tax assessor. First uh, female on that uh, position, first Latina in that position. Congratulations. Council President Waterman. Okay, so items 10.27 to 10.40 are approved 7-0. Items 10.41 to 10.50, Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. For all. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye for all. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. K items 10.41 to 10.50 are approved 7-0. Items 10.51 to 10.61. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye for all. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye for all. Councilperson Solomon. Aye for all. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Waterman. Aye. K items 10.51 to 10.61 are approved 7-0. Um, items 10.62 to 10.65, 10.66 uh, was voted on earlier. Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye for all. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, we're actually, um, let me let me redo that. So 10.62 to 10.65, 10.66 was voted on earlier and we are withdrawing 10.64. Uh, so Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye for all. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. Aye for all. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis, not here. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. Council President Woodman. Aye. Okay, 10.62 to 10.65 with 10.64 uh, being withdrawn and 10.66 voted on earlier. These resolutions are approved 7-0. Oh, I just want to say you did a good job tonight, young lady. Yeah. I know Danny is hard on you, but you did a good job, young lady. Thank you very much, Councilman. You know, Alon, I do you have a saying like to wrap it up for us? Or <laughs> <laughs> teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> Amanda, be yourself. <laughs> okay. Amanda, motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> motion to adjourn made by Councilperson Rivera. Seconded by Councilperson Soleil. On the motion to adjourn at 9.08 p.m., Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Councilperson Baggiano is not here. Councilperson Soleil. There's no I in team, but I'm saying I tonight. I. Councilperson Solomon. Councilperson Gilmore. Aye. Councilperson DeGis is not here. Councilperson Rivera. Yeah. And Council President Waterman. A motion to adjourn at 9.08 p.m. Thank you very much, and we are out of here. Have a good night, everyone. Get home safe.